Uh, what are ways to improve LIGO in the future, increase the sensitivity? I've seen a few ideas that are kind of fascinating. <laughs> Is Are you interested in them? Sort of looking, I'm not speaking about five years, perhaps you could speak to the next five years, but also the next hundred years. Yeah, so let me let me talk to both the instrument and the science. Sure. So yes, that's, please. they go hand in hand. I mean, the thing that I said is if we make it better, we see more kinds of weaker objects and we do astronomy, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we're very motivated to make a new instrument, which will be a big step, the next step, like making a new kind of telescope or something. Mm -hmm. And um, the ideas of what that instrument should be uh, haven't converged yet. There's different ideas in Europe. They've done more work to kind of uh, develop the ideas, but they're different from ours, and we have ideas. So, but I think over the next few years, we'll develop those. The idea is to make an instrument that's at least 10 times better than what we have, what we can do with this instrument, 10 times better than that. 10 times better means you can look 10 times further out. 10 times further out is a thousand times more volume. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing much, much more of the universe. The big change is that if you can see far out, you far, you see further back in history. Yeah, you're traveling back in time. Yeah. And so we can start to do what we call cosmology instead of astronomy or astrophysics. Cosmology is really the study of the evolution of the... Oh, universe. interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so then you can start... To to hope to get to the uh, important problems having to do with uh, how the universe began, how it evolved, and so forth, which we really only study now with optical instruments or um, uh, electromagnetic waves. Mm -hmm. And early in the universe, those were blocked because basically it wasn't transparent, so the photons couldn't get out when everything was too dense. What do you think, sorry, on this tangent, what do you think an understanding of gravitational waves from earlier in the universe can help us understand about the Big Bang and all that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah, that's, that's so. But, but it's a non, it's a, it's a, it's another perspective on the thing. Is, is there some insights you think that could be revealed just to help a layman understand? Sure. First, we don't understand. We use the word Big Bang. We don't understand the physics of what, the Big Bang itself was. Um, so I think um, my, my, and in the early stage, there were particles and there was a huge amount of gravity and mass being made. And so um, the big, the, so, so I'll say two things. One is how did it all start? How did it happen? And I'll give you at least one example mm -hmm. that we don't understand what we should understand. We don't know why we're here. Yes. No, we do not. I don't mean it philosophically. I mean it in terms of physics, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? If I go into my laboratory at CERN or somewhere and I collide particles together or put energy together, I make as much antimatter as matter. Right. Antimatter then annihilates matter and makes energy. So in the early universe, there you made somehow, somehow a lot of matter and antimatter, but there was an asymmetry. Somehow there was more matter and antimatter. The matter and antimatter annihilated each other, or at least that's what we think. And there was matter, only matter left over, and we live in a universe that we see that's all matter. We don't have any idea. We have an ideas, but we don't have any we don't have any way to understand that at the present time with the physics that we know. Can I ask a dumb question? Does uh, antimatter have anything like a gravitational field to uh, send signals? So how how does this asymmetry of matter antimatter could be investigated or further understood by observing gravitational fields or weirdnesses in gravitational fields? I, I think that in principle, if there were, you know, um, anti-neutron stars instead of just neutron stars, we would see uh, different kind of signals. But 
it didn't get to that. It's We live in a universe that we've done enough looking because we don't see anti matter, anti-protons anywhere, no matter what we look at, that it's all made out of matter. Hmm. There is no antimatter except when we go in our laboratories. So, but when we go in our laboratories, we make as much antimatter as matter. So there's something about the early universe that made this asymmetry. So we can't even explain why we're here. That's what I meant. Yeah. Physics, physics wise, not, uh, you know, uh, not in terms of how we evolved and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so there might be inklings of, uh, of some of the physics that uh, gravitational so so waves gravitational will waves don't get obstructed like light. So ah, I said light only goes to so three hundred thousand years. So it goes back to the beginning. So if you could study the early universe with gravitational waves, we can't do that yet. Then uh, it took four hundred years to be able to do that with optical. But uh, then you can really understand the very maybe understand the very early universe. So in terms of uh, Questions like why we're here or what the Big Bang was, um, we should be, we can in principle study that with gravitational waves. So to keep moving in this direction, it's a unique kind of uh, way to understand our universe. So you think there's more Nobel Prize level ideas to be discovered in relation to? I'd be shocked if there gravitational if, waves. If there isn't, uh, not even going to that, which is a very long range problem, but. I think that uh, we only see with electromagnetic waves 4% of what's out there. Uh, there must be, we looked for things that we knew should be there. Uh, there should be, uh, um, I would be shocked if there wasn't physics, objects, science, and with gravity that doesn't show up in everything we do with telescopes. So I think we're just limited by not having powerful enough instruments yet to do this. Do you have a preference? I keep seeing this uh, E-Lisa idea. Yeah. Is it, do you have a preference for earthbound or spacefaring? mechanisms for they're, they're complementary it's a little bit measuring like signal it's a it's completely analogous to what's been done in astronomy right so astronomy from the time of galileo was done with uh, visible light yeah Astro the big advances in astronomy in the last 50 years are because we have instruments that look at the infrared uh, microwave ultraviolet and so forth so looking at different wavelengths has been important. Basically, going into space means that we'll look at, instead of the audio band, which we look at, as we said, on the Earth's surface, we'll look at lower frequencies. It's, oh, sure. So it's completely complementary, and it starts to be looking at different frequencies, just like we do with astronomy. Isn't it a little, it seems almost incredible to me, engineering-wise, just like on Earth, to send something that's kilometers across into uh, into space. Is that, well, is the, that harder the, to engineer? As the, a... the, it, it actually is a little different. It's three satellites separated by hundreds of thousands of kilometers. And they send a laser beam from one to the other. And um, if they, the distance, if the triangle changes shape a little bit, they detect that from a gra did, passage. Sorry, did you say hundreds of thousands of kilometers? Yeah. yeah. Sending lasers to each other. <laughs> okay it's just engineering <laughs> um is it's possible though uh is yes. doable yes okay <laughs> uh that's uh, that's just incredible because they have to maintain i mean the precision here is probably there there might be some more what is it maybe noise is a smaller problem i guess there's no vibration to to to, to worry about like seismic stuff so getting away from Earth, maybe you get away from the Yeah, those parts stuff. are easier. They don't have to measure it as accurately at low frequencies. Uh, but they have uh, a lot of tough engineering problems. The the In order to detect that the, the uh, gravitational waves affect things, the sensors have to be f what we call free masses, just like ours, are isolated from the Earth. They have to isolate it from the satellite. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a hard problem. They have to do that pretty, not as well as we have to do it, but very well. And uh, they've done a test mission and it, the engineering seems to be, at least in principle, in hand. This will be in the 2030s. When 2030s? Yeah. This is incredible. This is, uh, this is, this is incredible. Uh, let me ask about Bob Black Holes. Um, yeah. So what we're talking about is observing uh, orbiting black holes. Uh, the, the, I, get, I saw the terminology of like binary black hole systems. Binary black holes. Is that's that's when they're the, the when yeah. that's when they're dancing? Okay. Both so, going around each other, just like the Earth around the Sun. Okay. Is that weird that there's black holes going around each other? So the finding binary systems of stars is similar to finding binary systems of uh, or black holes. Well, they were once stars. So, um, so I, we haven't said what the, what a black hole is physically yet. Yeah. So, what's a black hole? So, black hole is a is first it's a mathematical concept or a physical concept, and that is a region of space. So it's simply a region of space where the curvature of space-time, meaning the gravitational field, is so strong that nothing can get out, yeah. including light. And as light gets bent in gravitational, if the gravitation, if the space-time is warped enough, and so even light gets bent around and stays in it. So that's the concept of a black hole. So it's not a, f and maybe you can make, maybe it's a, so that's a concept that didn't say how they come about. Mm -hmm. And uh, there could be different ways they come about. The ones that we are seeing, uh, there's a, we're not sure. That's what we're trying to learn now is what they, but the general expectation is that they come, uh, the bla these black holes happen when a star dies. Right. So what does that mean that a star dies? What happens? A star like our sun, um uh, basically makes heat and light by fusion it's made up and as it burns it burns up the hydrogen and then the helium and then the, and slowly works its way up to the heavier and heavier elements that are in the star and uh when it gets up to iron the fusion process doesn't work anymore and so the stars die and that happens to stars and then they do what's called a supernova. What happens then is that a star is a delicate balance between an outward pressure from fusion and light and burning and an inward pressure of gravity trying to pull the masses together. Mm -hmm. Once it burns itself out, it goes and it collapses and that's a supernova. When it collapses, all the mass that was there is in a very much smaller space. And if a star if you do the calculations, if a star is big enough, that can create a strong enough gravitational field to make a black hole. Our sun won't. It's too small. Too small. And we don't know exactly what it, but it's usually thought that a star has to be at least three times as big as our sun mm -hmm. to make a black hole. But that's the physical way there. You can make black holes. That's the first um, explanation that one would give for the for what we see, but it's not necessarily true. We're not sure yet. Where. What we see in terms of for the origins of the black holes? No, the black holes that but, we see in gravitational waves. So the but you're also looking for the ones who are binary solar systems, like so the, they're binary systems, but they could have been made from binary stars. So there's binary stars around. So that's. Gotcha. So, so, the, so that's so the first explanation is that that's what they are. Gotcha. Um, other explain, but but what we see has some puzzles. This is kind of the way science works, I guess. Yeah. Um, we see heavier ones than up to. We've seen w one system that was 140 times the mass of our own sun. Our, wow. Yeah. That's not believed to be possible with the parent being a big star because big stars can only be so big mm -hmm. uh, or they uh, are unstable. It's just the, the fact that they live in an environment that makes them unstable. 
So uh, the fact that we see bigger ones, they may be come from something else. It's possible that they were uh, made in a different way by little ones eating each other up, or maybe they were made, mm. or maybe they came with the Big Bang, the prime, what we call primordial, which means they're really different. They came from that. We don't know at this point. We're, if they came with the Big Bang, then maybe they account for what we call dark matter or some of it. Hmm. Like there was a lot of them if they came with a, and because yeah. there's a lot of dark matter. Yeah. But uh, will gravitational waves give you any kind of in, um, intuition about the origin of these I, oscillating? We think that if we see um, the distributions, enough of them, the distributions of their masses, the distributions of their how they're spinning. So we can actually measure when they're going around each other, whether they're spinning, you know, like this. The or direction around. of the spin? Or, yeah. or no, the and orientation. Whether the, the whole system has any wobbles. What? <laughs> We, so this is this is now okay. And we're then, do, we're doing that, and now. then you're constantly kind of crawling back and back in time, and, and we're crawling back in time and seeing how many there are as we go back. And so, do they point back? So to, you're like, uh, what is that discipline called? Cartography or something? You're like mapping this the early universe via the lens of gravitational yeah, waves. Not, not yet the early universe, but at least back in time. earlier. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, so black holes are this mathematical phenomenon, but they come about in different ways. We have a huge black hole at the center of our galaxy mm -hmm. and other galaxies. Those probably were made some other way. We don't know when the galaxies themselves had to do with the formation of the galaxies. We, we don't really know. So the fact that we use the word black hole, the origin of black holes might be quite different mm -hmm. depending on how they happen. They just have to, in the end, have a gravitational field that will bend everything in. How do you feel about black holes as a human being? There's a, there's this thing that's nearly infinitely dense, can doesn't let, let light, light escape. Isn't that kind of terrifying? Feels like the stuff of nightmares. I think, just... it, I think it's it's an opportunity. To, to, to do what exactly? <laughs> so, uh, at, like the early universe is an opportunity. If I, we can study the early universe, we can learn things like I told you. And here again, we have an embarrassing situation in physics. Yes. We have two wonderful theories of physics. One based on quantum mechanics, qu quantum field theory. And we can go to a big accelerator like at CERN and smash particles together and almost explain anything that happens beautifully using quantum field theory and quantum mechanics. Then we have another theory of physics called general relativity, which is what we've been talking about most of the time, which is fantastic at describing uh, things at high velocities, long distances, you know, uh, and so forth. So that's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, we're trying to create a theory of physics, not two theories of physics. Mm -hmm. So we have an embarrassment that we have two different theories of physics. People have tried to make a unified theory, what they call a unified theory. You've heard those words for decades. Uh, they still haven't. That's been primarily done theoretically or tried, they, people actively do that. My personal belief is that the, like mu much of physics, we need some clues. So we need some experimental evidence. So where is there a place? If we go to CERN and do those experiments, gravitational waves or general relativity don't matter. Yes. If we go to study you know, our black holes, elementary particle physics doesn't matter. We're studying these huge objects. So where might we have a place where both phenomena have to be satisfied? An what, example is black holes. Inside black holes. Yeah. So we can't do that today. But when I think of black hole, it's a potential treasure chest of understanding the fundamental problems of physics and maybe can give us clues to how we bring to the embarrassment of having two theories of physics together. That's my own rom romantic What's idea. the worst that could happen? It's so enticing. Just go in and look. Uh, do you think... Um... How far are we away from figuring out the unified uh, 
theory of physics, a theory well, of everything. I, I think. What's your sense? Who will solve it? Like, what discipline will solve it? Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, so little progress has been made uh, without more experimental clues, as I said, that we're not, uh, we're just not able to say that we're close without some clues. The best, the closest, the most popular theory these days that might lead to that is called string theory. Yeah. And the problem with string theory is it works, uh, it solves a lot of beautiful mathematical problems we have in physics. And uh, and uh, uh, it's it's uh, very satisfying theoretically, but it has almost no predictive, maybe no predictive ability because it is a theory that works in eleven dimensions. We live in a physical world of three space and one time dimension. In order to make predictions in our world with string theory you have to somehow get rid of these other seven dimensions. That's done mathematically by saying they curl up on each other on scales that are too small to affect anything here. But how you do that, and that's okay, that's an okay argument, but how you do that is not unique. Mm. So that means if I start with that theory and I go to our world here, I can't uniquely go to it. Which means and if it's I not predictive. It's not predictive. And that's that's actually and that's string, a killer. That's yeah. a killer. And string theory is it seems like from my outsider's perspective has lost favor over the years, perhaps because of this very yeah, idea. It's a lack of predictive power. I mean, that science has to connect to something where you make predictions as beautiful as it as it might be. So I don't think we're close. I think we need some experimental clues. It may be that information on something we don't understand presently at all, like dark energy or probably not dark matter, but dark energy or something might give us some ideas. But I, I don't think we're, I can't envision right now um, in the short term, meaning, you know, the horizon that we can see how we're gonna uh, bring these two theories together.